very special, first of all, because I was a PhD in Stony Brook, uh, although in physics. And uh, since I graduated in 89, this is the first talk I'm giving uh, at Stony Brook. And interestingly enough, uh, Lane was also present at the last one, which was my PhD defense. <laughs> so there's a certain symmetry to, to the situation. So it's, uh, it's really a pleasure, and uh, happy birthday, Lane. OK, so I want to talk about um, the geometry of the moduli space of hyperbolic monopoles from the point of view of supersymmetry. So coming to Stony Brook to talk about supersymmetry is like the proverbial bringing coal to Newcastle. So I, I sort of apologize for that. I hope uh, the audience is mostly mathematical this time, so I suppose that uh, may maybe I um, have to find a way of making supersymmetry palatable. And I'm not sure I'll succeed, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So there was, <clears throat> in the 1960s, uh, there, was a, there was a famous uh, case in the US, in the Supreme Court, um, a case about obscenity. There was a French film, Les Amants, and uh, somebody, I think, in Ohio found it objectionable, and they tried to, to, make, to, to ban this on the, on the grounds of obscenity. And there was a famous um, opinion by one of the justices, I think it was Potter Stewart, who said he, he refused to define obscenity, but he knew it when he saw it. So I'm not going to define supersymmetry, but hopefully what I'm going to do is give you enough information so that, like, like Justice Stewart, you can say, I, I know it when I see it. <laughs> But I should give you a bit of a history, perhaps, first of all, of, uh, well, OK, here's the plan, by the way. So I should mention, this is work, uh, joint work, which we're writing up with uh, my PhD, well, one of my PhD students, uh, Mustafa Garamti. And, and the plan is going to be essentially that. that. At the beginning, I'll, let's see, I'll say a little bit about supersymmetry. Um, then I'll discuss uh, monopoles, and in particular, hyperbolic monopoles. And then uh, the, the supersymmetry um, uh, approach to, to the geometry of the moduli space, which goes by way of constructing a supersymmetric Yang Mills Higgs theory on hyperbolic space, and then uh, seeing what that uh, theory tells us about the, the, the geometry of the moduli space. Okay, so I'll start with supersymmetry, uh, just a little bit of the history, and maybe even why it's called supersymmetry. So back in the 60s, um, there was, pe pe people had been doing, this is in the context of uh, elementary particle physics, so People had noticed certain symmetries in particle physics. There was the fact that particles, um, they transform according to irreducible representations of the isometry group of uh, Minkowski space-time, and that's the Poincaré group. That's uh, what I call here P. And then there was um, internal symmetries that seemed to organize the great, you know, complicated spectrum of particles that they were discovering. And usually, typically, it's a um, compact uh, Lie group K. And then the question was, is there some sort of overarching symmetry and they call that supersymmetry in this, as opposed to, you know, you have a subgroup and then you have a supergroup, i.e. a group which contains um, the internal symmetry group and the Poincaré group. And this went, well, I think uh, some people used to refer to this as a relativistic quark model. And uh, there was a famous theorem, uh, no-go theorem, by Coleman Mandula in 67 that said that under some conditions, no such group exists. Namely, uh, the group had to be precisely just the product, P cross K. But then years later, um, the, 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 there was a positive theorem that says that there is indeed uh, such a group, well, quote unquote group. I mean, it has to be uh, what is now known as a Lie supergroup, i.e., the, the, the infinitesimal, uh, you know, the, the, the Lie algebra of G is actually a Lie super algebra. So, uh, Z2 graded, uh, they used to call them Z2 graded Lie algebras, but I think now they're just called Lie super algebras. Okay, so. Um, there's two kinds of particles in, that we know of, and they're uh, usually called bosons and fermions. And one way to distinguish them, you can dis distinguish them the uh, representation theoretically. They, they, this is all in the context of four-dimensional field theory. So they, would, uh, um, they, they transform according to different uh, types of representations of the, uh, of the uh, Poincaré group, which are induced from representations, uh, let's say, in the massive case of of uh, SU2 subgroup, the spin cover of the, of the rotation group, and in the massless case by um, some, the, well, some other group, some sort of Euclidean group. But the point is, when you look at the equations they satisfy, one thing that you immediately notice is that bosons obey second order equations and fermions obey first order equations. So these are PDEs that are well known. For example, for bosons, you have for a scalar field the Klein Gordon equation, that being the Dahlenbergian, so that's a second order differential operator. Or if you think of the Maxwell equation, so uh, uh, A is the, is the Maxwell field, now the, the potential if you wish, F is D of A, so one derivative on A, and then Maxwell equation says that 
you take a second derivative, essentially. So that's second order in A. Whereas uh, for the fermions, okay, typical equations are the Dirac equation. So here you have the Dirac operator on flat Minkowski space. Um, Rarita Schwinger that was mentioned uh, in jean pierres talk, I mean, it's, uh, again, just first order in, in derivatives. So supersymmetry, as it turns out, is a, um, it's, it's, let's say, a Lie superalgebra, some sort of uh, symmetry that relates uh, bosons and fermions. So what it does, it is, in some sense, uh, relating solutions of first order PDEs to solutions of second order PDEs. So you can write down very explicitly uh, field theories uh, containing both bosonic and fermionic fields. And then what you find is that if you have, for example, a fermionic field that obeys the Dirac equation, and you do a supersymmetry variation, then you get some bosonic field that satisfies a second order equation. So supersymmetry is, is, is you can think of it mathematically. So finding supersymmetry in nature may be difficult, but in, in mathematics seems to be quite easy. Every time you have a situation where a first order PDE implies a second order PDE, that's supersymmetry, or there is some supersymmetry underlying that. So, okay, so we can immediately think of, of uh, two famous examples. And when I say famous, I mean that those are the examples I know. Uh, but they are, I think, quite famous. And in fact, uh, Blaine has made uh, fantastic contributions to both of them. The first one, of course, calibrated geometry. So we've heard a lot of talks about this already. So um, calibrated, the, the fundamental lemma, if you wish, of calibrated geometry says that calibrated submanifolds are minimal. In fact, more than minimal, but, but in particular, they're minimal. So um, calibrated, of course, is a first order PDE. What you're doing is, if you think of uh, your, your, um, your functions as, as defining, say, the embedding of the submanifold in, in the Riemannian manifold, the calibrated condition is a condition on the tangent spaces of these submanifolds. So it's a first order condition on the, on the, embedding, uh, on the embedding functions. Whereas uh, minimality is just saying that the mean curvature is zero, and that's a second order uh, condition on the, on the functions of the embedding. So this is the case of uh, first order PDE implying a second order PDE. Of course, it implies more. It's in some sense really minimizing, but nevertheless, it's, we, we have this. So it, isn't, it shouldn't be surprising that there is some supersymmetry underlying this. And in fact, there are supersymmetric field theories whose BPS configurations, and I'll put this in quotes because I'll define it in, in a particular theory uh, later, uh, whose uh, BPS configurations are calibrated submanifolds. And uh, Kamran talked about this uh, in his talk. Uh, the basic condition, in fact, the way it appears, is as follows. It's an, a condition that says that you have some non-zero spinner, which is an eigen spinner of Clifford product by the polyvector that you get. You, know, you, 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 you look at the tangent plane and you think of it as a polyvector by choosing, for example, an orthonormal frame for the, for the tangent space of the submanifold, you wedge it all together. That's now something inside the, it's a polyvector, or using the metric, think of it inside the exterior uh, algebra differential form, and then it can act on, uh, on, the, on the spinners by Clifford product. And whenever you have an equation of this type, then it doesn't take much to, to show that uh, this implies that um, the tangent plane is calibrated by a uh, calibration, so differential form you make by squaring that spinner. Okay, um, so that's one example. The other example, which is the one that is more relevant to this uh, to this talk, is the gauge theory. So to to be definite, let's consider gauge theory on R four. So we have some principal G bundle G. You can take it to be SU two if you wish. Some you know compactly group is fine. Um, then you have a gauge field, which is locally looks like a one form in R4 with coefficients in the Lie algebra of, of the group G. Then uh, you can compute the curvature of, of so the field strength. So derivative of A plus one half A wedge A commutator. And that's a two form now in R4 with uh, coefficients on the, on the Lie algebra. Then um, this FA satisfies something called the Bianchi identity. Um, so you can define a covariant exterior derivative, uh, which is the exterior derivative plus, uh, you know, commutator with uh, com commutator and wedge with uh, with a gauge field A, and if you apply this to f of A, it's just a calculation to show that that vanishes. But then there is an equation, which is the Yang-Mills equation, which is what you get by varying the Yang-Mills action, that says that, um, well, essentially the divergence, if you wish, of uh, of the field strength vanishes. And that, of course, is a second order uh, condition on A, because F is already one derivative in A. So here you have a second derivative on A. So that's a second order equation in A. However, if you impose a first order equation, namely the 
uh, with one sign would be self-duality, with the other sign anti-self-duality of the field strength that says that it's an eigen uh, form of the Hodge, op Hodge star with either plus or minus uh, one eigenvalue, then this first order condition implies a second order condition namely because of the Bianchi identity. So if star FA is plus or minus FA, then the Bianchi identity gives you the young mills equation. So here you have another situation where indeed a first order um, condition on the gauge field A implies a second order condition. Okay, so, uh, and indeed, okay, there's, there's supersymmetric theories uh, whose BPS states or BPS configurations are indeed the self-dual or anti-self-dual connections. And the equation, the thing that plays the role of, the, of this equation that we had before of the plane acting on the spinner is the spinner, now says that the field strength annihilates the spinner. So in R4, that condition says that this two form has to be in the uh, stabilizer of a spinner, and that stabilizer of a spinner means there's going to be either self-dual or anti-self-dual two-form. Anyway, so just, uh, just to mention all this, this won't really play a role, but um, it isn't just the first order equation implying a second order equation, but rather you are getting very interesting solutions of the second order equation, namely the ones that are in some sense optimal in a way. So here uh, in the calibrated case, of course, they're uh, homologically volume, volume minimizing and A is uh, anti-self-dual, we call them instantons. So instantons are also absolute minima of the Young-Mills action, which is just the L2 norm of the, of the field strength. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of supersymmetry. <laughs> uh, there'll be chances of seeing supersymmetry in action a bit later on, and I'm afraid it won't be, perhaps, it'll be a slightly more, uh, you know, there'll be some formula, so um, maybe not immediately uh, nice. Okay, so let's talk about monopoles. Um, so monopoles, um, okay, so let, let's consider monopoles in R3. So you write uh, R4, the R4 that we were discussing the gauge theory on, as R3 cross R, and let me call X4 the coordinate along this, this, this uh, copy of the real line, and let me assume that the gauge field doesn't depend on that, uh, on that coordinate. So these are translationally invariant uh, gauge fields. So you can then, um, think of the fourth, the fourth component of the gauge field as some sort of function which I call phi. So let me split this gauge field as a one form on R3 and a zero form on R3, so A and phi. And then if you look at the self-duality or anti-self-duality condition for this, for, this, for this gauge field A in R4, uh, that becomes, once you take into account the translational invariance, uh, the so-called Bogomolny equation on R3 which says that uh, the Hodge star, but this is the Hodge star in R3 now, of, of the curvature. So the curvature is a two form. The Hodge star in three dimensions is going to be a one form. So that one form is plus or minus the covariant derivative of phi. Phi is known as the Higgs field. And of course the Higgs uh, is uh, perhaps was found this year. So it's, uh, of course not this Higgs, but you know. Uh, in fact, we don't know which Higgs we found, but uh, the, some, some Higgs was found. <laughs> okay, so, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I must have, right. So, um, okay, so um, gauge fields which have finite Young-Mills action, of course, they will not have finite action in three dimensions because uh, of the fact that they're translationally invariant. So, um, or rather, let me say it again. Um, from the four-dimensional point of view, translational invariant says that uh, when you look at the, young, the L2 norm of the, of, of the field strength, this doesn't depend on, on, on X4, so you get, the in, you, get, you, know, you get infinite because of, the, of, of, of R, integration over R. But they do have finite energy in three dimensions. So this, this thing is what is, uh, what is finite now. So if you uh, integrate over R3, the L2 norm of that curvature plus the covering the derivative of the Higgs, then that, that, um, that is finite. So anyway, what this is telling you is that essentially monopoles, i.e. solutions of uh, Bogomolny equation in R3, are the same thing as translationally invariant instantons in R4. And okay, there's, there's the, that they've been studied and a lot is known about them. Um, there's another interesting uh, reduction of the self-duality equations in four dimensions, and that was pointed out, I think, by Atiyah in the first place. Um, you, instead of doing translationally invariant uh, instantons, you look at rotationally invariant instantons. 
So which rotations do you take? Well, consider the circle acting on R4 as, say, you know, the standard R4 with coordinates x1, x2, x3, x4. So that circle is rotating in the x3, x4 plane. And uh, therefore, it fixes uh, the origin in that plane. But of course, that's a, that's a two plane in R4. So the two plane corresponding to x3 equals x4 equals 0. So on the complement of that two plane, uh, what you can do is you can take the Euclidean metric on R4 and write it in this funny way. So you choose polar coordinates for the x3, x2, x3, x4 plane, so dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. And then you, you take away this r squared out. And that's OK, because uh, since you've taken out the points where r is 0, r is non-zero. So you can divide by r. And what you get here is, when you, when you think of it, this, this metric in here, it's precisely the hyperbolic uh, metric on the upper half space. And, uh, and this is just d theta squared. So um, the complement of this two plane in R4 is actually conformal to hyperbolic three space times the circle. Now, one wonderful fact about the self-duality equations is that they're conformally invariant. So if you have an anti-self-dual or self-dual uh, gauge field on R4, that's going to give you, a, again, a self-dual or anti-self-dual gauge field on anything conformal to R4. So in particular, if it's, R, if, it's, if it's ASD on R4, then also in R4 minus that two-plane, and hence it's going to be uh, an instant on or anti-instant on an H3 kind, times the circle. So if you say that it's now invariant under the rotations of the circle, what you get is a solution of the Bogomolny equation on, on H3. So just the same argument as for R3. And what you get are these things called hyperbolic monopoles. So the data is some one form on hyperbolic space with uh, values in a Lie algebra and, uh, and a Higgs, which is a function uh, with values in the Lie algebra, and it satisfies the Bogomolny equation with one of the two signs. So you get monopoles and anti-monopoles. OK, so these are the main objects of, uh, of, of what I want to talk about. Um, so what is known about them? Well, first of all, they're labeled by two, um, two, two, two numbers. One is the mass, which we can think of it as the limit. Here I write things in a rather sketchy way. All I mean is the, is the asymptotic limit. Uh, depending on which model of the hyperbolic space you choose, you take one coordinate to either 0 or infinity or whatever. But anyway, so the asymptotic value of the norm of the Higgs field, that's going to be some number m. And then there's the charge which uh, I normalize like this. So 1 over 4 pi times m, m is that. And then you integrate over hyperbolic space. By trace here, I mean uh, invariant inner product on the Lie algebra of the wedge of the field strength and the covariant derivative of the Higgs. Now, if you were on R3, uh, you never see the mass simply because, well, you can always rescale the metric to make the mass equals to 1. But in H3, when you rescale the metric, all you're changing is the curvature of hyperbolic space. So that there's, you know, there's the, you, you, can, you can either choose the mass to be always one and then just work on different hyperbolic spaces with different curvatures, or you could just fix the curvature of hyperbolic space and then consider the mass. So either of the two ways are interesting, I guess. Um, so then we have a moduli space, which is the solutions of Bogomolny equation with a given charge and a given mass uh, quotiented by the action of the gauge group. And there's a fact is that uh, the dimension of this space is four times the absolute value of the charge. So it's, um, it's always a multiple of four. And the natural geometry, sorry, that n should have been an m. I don't know why, just mental typo. Uh, um, then the question is, what is the geometry of this moduli space? So now we know what the answer is. I mean, not, not because of this work, but uh, earlier work. And what we're going to do is derive the same results using supersymmetry. OK, so um, for monopoles in R3, the moduli space is hyperkähler. But um, for the hyperbolic monopoles, uh, the moduli space does not, at least does not seem to inherit a metric from the gauge theory. So the natural metric that you would write from the gauge theory, at least in principle, doesn't mean you can actually compute this in most, most cases, but uh, um, it would be the L2 metric. So if you have a small um, deformation of the monopole, so you know, tangent vector to the moduli space, so delta A, delta phi, you look at the L2 norm. And what happens in, in R3 is that this is actually gives you, gives you a metric on the, on the moduli space. But in, in the case of hyperbolic space, this, this doesn't always, well, I say equals to infinity, it doesn't always converge 
so that you don't always get a metric there. So the geometry is not a Riemannian geometry, let's put it this way. It's going to be a differential geometry, but there is no metric, or at least no metric that is, that is, uh, that is inherited from, from the physics. That does not mean that you cannot put interesting metrics on the, on the moduli space. So for example, uh, in the case of charge two, and when you look at, uh, you fix the center of mass of, of the monopoles, then uh, Nigel Hitchin has constructed self-dual uh, Einstein metrics. Um, so this is now, they depend on m. m is the mass, or if you wish, one over m squared is the uh, is the curvature of uh, of uh, hyperbolic space. Well, minus one over m squared is the curvature of hyperbolic space. And then um, you have a natural sequence of these uh, self-dual Einstein metrics. And when you take the limit m goes to infinity, which is the same thing as the flat limit. So the hyperbolic space is going flatter and flatter. In the limit, it goes to the Atiyah-Hitchin metric on the uh, charge to uh, centered monopole in in R three. So one problem, which is, it seems interesting to me, is how to obtain uh, the Hitchin metrics uh, from the gauge theory. Um, maybe there's a way to regularize things in such a way that one gets these metrics. But okay, so I don't know the answer to that question, but it's something interesting to think about. Um, okay, so what is known about the the, the, moduli, the geometry of the moduli space? So, <clears throat> so these are recent results of uh, Roger Bielavsky and Laurent Schwachhofer, who uh, build on earlier work of Oliver Nash. And what they've shown is that M has a sort of um, some structure which they called uh, pluricomplex. And what I, for me, I, I, I won't say what pluricomplex is except to, to give this alternative definition, which is basically that on the complexified tangent bundle to the moduli space, you have a C linear hypercomplex structure. So that C is that C. So it commutes with, so what you have is an action on the one hand by quaternions and on the other hand by the complex numbers. And that's the same thing as having an action of the endomorphism algebra of, of, of C2. But anyway, one way of thinking about it is you have um, C linear complex structures, I, J, and K, satisfying the standard quaternion algebra. So what I would like to do in this talk is to show that this is actually a natural consequence of, of supersymmetry. Of course, supersymmetry itself may not seem very natural when you first uh, see it, but at least that's, uh, for, from some perspective, it's, it's very natural. So this, the strategy is going to be, we're going to construct a supersymmetric theory on hyperbolic space whose BPS configurations, and I'll define what that is, are precisely the hyperbolic monopoles. And then what that says is that if you manage to write down some sort of effective theory for the monopole mon moduli, so for the collective coordinates of the monopole moduli space, that theory is going to be supersymmetric. And demanding, or if you wish, uh, making sure that it is supersymmetric gives you some geometric constraints on the on the moduli space. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to try to explain. OK, so, um, so first we're going to talk about super young Mills Higgs on hyperbolic three space. So I'm not going to, of course, show you all the details. I'll just show you the answer. But the idea is the following. So we are going to start with something that everybody knows about, namely uh, super young Mills theory on, uh, on Minkowski space time four dimensions. So this is very standard. It's, it's one of the original uh, supersymmetric theories. Then we're going to Euclidianize this. So we're going we're to ar arrive from there to a supersymmetric young Mills theory on R4, but now with Euclidean metric. And we're going to follow uh, work that was done here in Stony Brook, in fact, a few years ago by Van Nieuwenhuizen and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Waldron. Then we're going to take that theory and we're going to just dimensionally reduce to R3. So it gives me a supersymmetric young Mills Higgs now theory on R3. And then we're going to deform this theory by introducing curvature on the R3. And what that does is essentially, well, we'll see. I mean, it, 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 it adds new terms to the action and changes um, how the supersymmetry is. So this is a fairly straightforward thing to do. So I won't bother you with the details. I'll show you what the answer is. And OK, so let, let's try to unpack this. So here's the action. So first of all, what are the objects? So well, we know the the. OK, one thing to notice is that everything gets complexified when you Euclidianize. So now we have, um, we have um, I call them the same way, the gauge field and the Higgs, one form and, and zero form in H3 with values in the Lie algebra, but they're, they're now complex. Um, F is something called an auxiliary field. And these two objects here, they're spinners. So dollar sign is the, uh, the, the spinner bundle on hyperbolic space. And they take values also in the Lie algebra. And the, and the action looks, you know, 
okay, I mean, if you've seen these things before, then it looks pretty standard. If not, then maybe it looks a bit mysterious, but this is just a standard, you know, Young Mills Higgs action. This is just the auxiliary field that has a standard algebraic term. And then this looks like what? Well, this is the Dirac operator. This is the Dirac action on, uh, you know, on, on, on that bundle. So a spinner is tensored with the adjoint bundle, if you wish. So this is Dirac operator twisted by the gauge field. This is kind of a Yukawa coupling of the Higgs to the two um, fermions. And then there's one term which is new. This is the thing that, uh, this is the deformation, if you wish, the, 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 the thing that says that you are in hyperbolic three space and it does depend on M. And remember, one, minus one over M squared is the curvature in hyperbolic space. So, and this is like a mass term for the, for the fermions. And this uh, mass here, these are the supersymmetry transformations. Um, I've grayed out a lot of them because they're not really relevant. I just want to uh, emphasize uh, these two that I left uh, sort of in, in blue. So what these are is you have uh, two, uh, let's call them, uh, well, okay. So first of all, we have uh, two killing spinners on hyperbolic three space. And in the next transparency, I'll show you the equations that they actually satisfy. Um, and for each such uh, spinner, epsilon L, let's say, there is a derivation on the fields, which is an odd derivation, which acts in the way that I've indicated. But the important thing to notice is, for example, let's look at this formula here. This says that the, um, this, this, this spinner field, psi, uh, transforms in this way. So it's the auxiliary field times the parameter. And then the combination that we have here is precisely the combination that if that were zero, it would be the Bogomolny equation acting on by Clifford product. This is a one form by Clifford product on, the, on, on that parameter. And similarly for the other, there's another supersymmetry transformation. There's a left and a right. And they satisfy a certain algebra. So first of all, the killing spinner equations are these. So they're just, uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote this for the dagger. I could have just daggered the whole thing and then x would be acting on the left as usual. Um, so these are two killing spinners arbitrary, but otherwise uh, satisfying these equations. And then the supersymmetry algebra is what you would expect. Um, the you know, two left supersymmetries commute, two right supersymmetries commute, and the bracket between a left and a right uh, gives you three things. One is a Lie derivative by a killing vector that you get by squaring. So for, if, if you're not used to this notation, I'm using the physics notation, I'm afraid. But I mean, essentially what it is is you take two spinners, you square them, you get a vector. And that vector, as we heard in the uh, Jean-Pierre's talk uh, a couple of days ago, that was, that was, that, that's a killing vector. So what you get is Lie derivative acting on your field uh, uh, by this killing vector. Then you get a gauge transformation with a parameter, which is the gauge field uh, acting on the killing vector. And uh, you get something called an R symmetry, which is a transformation whose parameter is a constant. And it's just the inner product of this. You can work out that if you take the inner product of two killing spinners, and one spinner is with one sign and the other one with the other, then this object is actually a constant. Okay, um, sorry, uh, let, let me go back. So let me now, so, so what is a BPS configuration? Well, a BPS configuration by definition is a configuration where the fermions, which are these two spinner fields, are set to zero and where um, there is some some killing spinner, either epsilon L or epsilon R, such that the supersymmetry variations uh, all vanish. So, um, so this is this. So either, so, so, the, so the spinners are zero, the fermions, the, the psi and chi are zero, and then either two things can happen. Either for some non-zero uh, killing spinner of one sign of the killing constant, uh, the left supersymmetry variation of psi is zero, and that, when you work it out, it implies that the auxiliary field is zero and uh, you get this Bogomolny equation with a plus sign. Or it could be that the other thing happens, namely that for some epsilon r uh, non-zero, uh, the right supersymmetry derivative of this chi is zero, in which case you get, again, that the, um, that the uh, auxiliary field vanishes and then you get the Bogomolny equation with the opposite sign. So what this is telling you is that the BPS configurations are precisely the hyperbolic monopoles. So what that means is that if you write down some effective theory for the monopole moduli, this theory will preserve some supersymmetry, namely the one that is you know, generated by the, by the, the, the killing 
for example, if you have monopoles as opposed to anti-monopoles, then you're in this situation. And that means that uh, for any uh, killing spinner with a positive constant, the supersymmetry variation vanishes. So what you'll have here is some supersymmetry left over, which is going to be um, uh, generate. Ah, sorry about that. Keep hitting the wrong button. Where am I? Here. Which is going to be generated by the, um, you know, by this epsilon L or epsilon R. And what we'll show is that the geometry of the moduli space is going to be constrained. OK, so the strategy is the following then. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to study, we're going to linearize uh, the system. We're going to look at zero modes, which are going to be linearized. So I'll explain what they are a bit later, but essentially they're just linearized solutions of the Bogomolny equation and the supersymmetric partners. Um, we're going to determine the supersymmetry transformation rules of the coordinates in the moduli space. And then if, if we had an action, which we don't in this case, we would impose that the action is invariant under these uh, transformations, and that constrains the geometry. But the fact that there is no metric induced, the L2 metric doesn't converge, that, that actually tells us that we don't, ha we don't have an action. So the way that uh, we get information from supersymmetries is, is instead by demanding that the supersymmetry algebra is actually realized. So that's what we call the closure of the supersymmetry algebra. And this will immediately tell us some constraints uh, on the geometry. OK, so let me talk about the zero modes. So the zero modes, they come in two kinds. There's bosonic zero modes and fermionic zero modes. The bosonic zero modes are going to be essentially, remember, the gauge field gets complexified when you do this Euclidean super young mills. So what we're dealing with is the complexified tangent space to the, to the, to the monopole moduli space. So what are they? Well, they're you know, small deformations of the gauge field and the Higgs uh, subject to two equations. First is the linearized Bogomolny equation. So that's what you get by just plugging the Bogomolny equation and think of, a, think of the, the, you know, linearizing it to first order. You get this. So the covariant derivative of delta phi plus the Hodge star on hyperbolic space of the covariant derivative of delta A minus the, the Higgs field commuted with delta A. That is equal to zero. And then you also get another condition, which is the one that says that you're in some sense, if you had a metric, this would be a condition that says that you are perpendicular to the gauge orbits. Because remember, the moduli space is solutions of Bogomolny equation modulo the action of the gauge group. So the tangent space of the moduli space is going to be a complement to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the gauge orbits. So, the, so that's, that's a condition. And this term kind of um, surprised us, but OK, it just follows from the supersymmetry. We have to put it there. So it's a, it's a, this is what you would expect, sort of the divergence, covariant divergence of the variation of the gauge field plus a uh, commutator of Higgs with the variation of the Higgs equal to zero. But in fact, we do get something else that depends explicitly on which uh, hyperbolic space we are. So that's uh, Gauss law. So bosonic zero modes are basically that. I mean, delta A, delta phi in this space, subject to these two equations. So those are the bosonic zero modes. We also have fermionic zero modes, um, which are going to be spinners with values in the Lie algebra. And they're solutions of the Dirac equation in the background of the monopole. So you look at the Dirac equation. So it's the Dirac operator twisted by the gauge field. Uh, and then a term which is just the commutator with, uh, with the Higgs field. And then there's a mass term, if you wish. So it's a massive Dirac equation. And the mass term depends on the, on the curvature of uh, hyperbolic space. And the curious thing about this is that uh, the bosonic and the fermionic zero modes, they actually there's a correspondence between them. It's a way to map between one and the other. And it's nothing but the supersymmetry that uh, the monopoles preserve. So suppose you take now, I changed the name. So let me call them eta and zeta to be two uh, spinners on hyperbolic space. But I'm going to take them to be uh, killing spinners. And again, for some reason, I'm always put, I, I work in the, because it only, only the dagger appears. But anyway, so they have different killing constant. That's the important thing to, to realize. Then you can, do the, you can, you can prove the following. So. Um, the, OK, so, the, so this is a way of building the uh, bosonic zero modes out of the fermionic zero mode. So if you build them in this way, and if the fermionic zero mode is indeed a zero mode, so it obeys the Dirac equation, then you can show that these two guys obey the linearized Bogomolny equation and Gauss law. And conversely, given a solution delta A delta phi of the linearized Bogomolny equation and Gauss's law, this particular combination solves the Dirac equation. So there's a supersymmetry between the, the you know, the, the, the zero modes. 
And this is the uh, remaining supersymmetry of, uh, of the, on the moduli space. OK, so it's convenient for calculations to actually work in a four-dimensional formalism. So we work in, rather than working in hyperbolic space, we work in hyperbolic space across the circle, but we take things to be invariant under the circle, so we're rotationally invariant. So let me, again, let me, let me think of delta A. This is where we started in some sense. You know, we had instantons that were rotationally invariant. So let me think of delta little a and delta phi as delta big A, which is now one form on hyperbolic space across the circle with values in the Lie algebra. And we need also to identify the spinners. So the spinners on hyperbolic space, I'm going to think of them as the negative chirality spinners on, on this four-dimensional manifold. And then the killing spinners on hyperbolic space, they, uh, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the spinners, well, uh, negative chirality spinners on this four-dimensional space that satisfy this equation. So this is just essentially the, the um, you know, the, the, the x here is tangent to hyperbolic space, so this is just the killing spinner equation. And then you, you, you demand that uh, if you have a vector which is along the circle, then it should be parallel along the circle. Okay, so now uh, we are going to see where this uh, uh, pluricomplex structure comes in. So what you do is you consider now uh, the space of killing spinners with positive and negative killing constants on so th the spaces that I defined here. So they're on H3 cross the circle, but parallel along the circle. And when you do this, uh, you can square two spinners, and you can... Uh, you can, just like before we got, a, we got a vector, you could also project onto the uh, two forms, and that essentially gives you endomorphisms of the, well, in this case, the complexified tangent space of hyperbolic space across the circle. And there's a basis for the image of this map, which I'm going to call I sub A. A goes, you know, it's, it's a four-dimensional. So I should have mentioned maybe the space of killing spinners on hyperbolic space is complex two-dimensional. So this is uh, C2 tensor C2, so this is a four-dimensional um, complex vector space, and that's a complex basis. But I'm thinking of these as endomorphisms of this complexified tangent space. And it's just the Clifford algebra, so it uh, satisfies the Clifford algebra. And the interesting fact, which is, again, a calculation, is that if you have a, a, a bosonic zero mode, so delta A that satisfies the linearized Bogomolny equation and Gauss's law, and you apply any one of these endomorphisms, then also satisfies the linearized Bogomolny equation and Gauss's law. So what you do is, what you, do is you, you end up getting endomorphisms of the, well, of the complexified tangent space of the moduli space. And we call them I alpha, so the same I, I hope it's not too confusing. But uh, sometimes we just call them I, J, K, and then it's, well, for this to be true, then I4 has to be, I should have written this on the other side, so I1, I2, I3, and I4. I4 would be uh, I times the identity. And they obey, of course. When you unpack that, this is just the standard um, quaternion algebra for i, j, k. OK, so I'm almost there. So now we can, we can, we can see what the geometry of the moduli space is. So I'm, I'm skipping some calculations, obviously. Um, so now I'm going to probe the geometry of the moduli space by considering maps from, let's say, the circle to, um, to the moduli space. So this is what would be a one-dimensional sigma model. But I don't have an action because of this absence of the L2 metric. So, um, but I do have the fields. So I think of, I look at maps from the circle to, uh, to the moduli space, and then I, I will have some, uh, some fermionic partners, so the super partners. So these are going to be sections of the pullback of the complexification of the tangent bundle of M to the circle. And uh, I should put a pi here, because these are actually, uh, I'm changing the parity. I'm making them odd. Should have done that, but uh, I'm not used to uh, doing that for some reason. And then you work out the supersymmetry that is inherited. I mean, this is calculation. The supersymmetry that is inherited from the one that is preserved by the, by the monopoles. And you find that it's given in this way. So um, alpha here can go from, alpha is the same, is this alpha here that goes from 1 to 4. So there's four supersymmetries, and they're written like that. Um, so we have here the, um, these endomorphisms, the almost quaternion. At this moment, they look like an almost quaternionic structure on the complexification of the monopole moduli space uh, times the lambda. And then when you do the lambda, you get the same thing times the derivative with respect to the circle coordinate on x and an extra term. 
And this extra term has a tensor, gamma ABC, which I think of it as the connection coefficients of some connection on the complexified tangent bundle of the monopole moduli space. And then what we do is we close the algebra. In other words, uh, we don't have an action to impose invariance, but we can impose closure of the algebra. So that is when you, when you look at the super algebra that these derivations, the supersymmetry transformations uh, satisfy, we would like them that when you take the uh, Lie you know, the, the Lie bracket of two of them on some field, and our fields here are x and lambda, then we should get minus the Kronecker delta times the derivative along the circle of the field. And then it's just a calculation. You work this out, and you work this out on, on, on x, first of all. So you, know, you, have, you have this, and you have that, and then you, you compute delta alpha, alpha delta beta on x, and using these two formulas, and you compute the commutator. And when you put all the terms to zero, you find the following. First of all, that the connection coefficients is symmetric, so that tells you the connection is torsion-free. The second is uh, this equation on, the, uh, on i, j, and k. I've only written it for i, but it's a similar equation for j and k. And the third condition that you get is that uh, you get this uh, frolischer Nienhaus bracket of any of the i, j, and k is equal to zero. So in particular, when you take alpha equals to beta, that just says that the Nienhaus tensor of that complex structure is, is zero. So in fact, the first thing we learn is that i, j, and k are integrable. So they define, indeed, a hypercomplex structure and they complexify moduli space. So that's what uh, uh, Bielawski and Schwachhofer call the pluricomplex manifold. And then, in fact, if you work a little harder, you can show that uh, th this, this equation here um, and torsion-free condition, this actually implies that uh, something stronger, namely that the uh, connection preserves i, j, and k. So this is actually the Obata connection for the Obata connection for this hypercomplex structure. Okay, and finally, uh, what, is, what happens on lambda? Well, on lambda, the, the supersymmetry algebra closes, and for that, you need to use some Bianchi-like identities for the curvature of the Obata connection. So, okay, it's torsion-free, so the standard Bianchi identity is, the algebraic Bianchi identity is zero, but also whenever you insert one or two of these uh, i, j, and k, in, uh, you should also get zero. And uh, that works out, I mean, it's easy to prove these things. So, um, so basically, well, okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Let me just mention two open questions, which I think are interesting from the point of view of the monopoles. So first of all, what are the dynamics of the small, uh, slow moving monopole? So in the case of monopoles in, uh, on, on, on flat space, you have a metric, this hyperkeller metric on the moduli space, and if you look at um, monopoles which don't have a lot of energy, so they're close to the, to the minimum, then these monopoles are going, to, uh, are going to evolve according to geodesics, of this hyperkeller metric on the moduli space. But here, we don't know. Um, we, I had a hope that maybe uh, the, supersymmetry wouldn't, the supersymmetry algebra wouldn't close on the nose, but rather it would give you some constraint that we could then derive an equation of motion from. But that didn't work out. So uh, I'm not sure how to get from uh, the dynamics from the physics. And the, the other open question is back the, well, the, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, which is, uh, we have this nice, at least on the charge two centered monopoles, we have the metrics of Nigel's, and then the question is how to get these things from, from the gauge theory. So that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, in fact, that, I mean, I'm not sure how to respond to whether it makes sense. It definitely makes sense because it exists. It happens. So, um, and indeed, there's um, for the case of uh, of uh, you know, in the case of the Hodge uh, story, there are supersymmetric theories where it's a supersymmetric sigma model in two dimensions that you can quantize and you get uh, you get exactly the Hamiltonian is the Hodge Laplacian, and the supersymmetry generators are are the D and D well, the, the, the left shed thing, so D and delta and D bar, uh, D star and delta. Maybe something uh, converse of supersymmetry. I don't know how to see that. Some characteristics. Because under certain circumstances. 
Could be. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always interested in seeing uh, other uh, examples of this phenomenon because I, to me, it's sort of an article of faith somehow. I know it's a meta principle that whenever this happens, I know there's some supersymmetry under there, and it's usually a lot of fun to try to find out where the supersymmetry is. Um, uh, my second question is, what do you mean by uh, plural complexity? Pluricomplex. Yeah, yeah. So pluricomplex, well, there, there's a more complicated definition which I don't have in my mind, but there, there is a, there is a, um, there's an equivalent formulation, which is this existence of a, com of, a, of, a, of a complex linear hypercomplex structure on the complexified tangent bundle. So you have IJK in satisfying the quaternion algebra, but they act complex linearly, and they, they are integral. Where's Nigel? There he is. <laughs> well, it, it was basically the construction of, uh, of a metric which included the data of the hyperbolic monopole. So there was no direct connection. I mean, the data that goes into constructing the hyperbolic monopole, which came from Peter's paper, basically, is precisely the same as the data that goes into constructing these, which were uh, constructed by algebraic geometry. Um, so that there's no purest thing is there's no direct link between the monopole equations and these metrics. So they exist on the monopole moduli space. The limit is the uh, when the, <coughs> the curvature goes to zero is the, the known hypercalum. But uh, going between the actual equations rather than the data which uh, defines it, defines the point in the moduli space. Uh, so it's you know, to say that they are on the moduli space of, uh, of hyperbolic monopole is true, but it's, it's using the data of their construction. But uh, actually, I had a question, which is, so your, your connection is on the complexified tangent bundle. How does it interact with the real structure, I mean, the real tangent bundle inside there? And that, does that... You know, evidence itself in this supersymmetry. So, I mean, it seems to me that you are complexifying everything and then you can't forget. Yes, you're right. I mean, so, th so that, that's, that's indeed something that we're presently trying to understand, which is starting from a different. There are many supersymmetric, uh, there's another at least, uh, construction of a supersymmetric theory on, on hyperbolic three space whose uh, BPS configurations are again the monopoles. And this one is built by uh, doing a dimensional reduction of a six dimensional. Uh, super young mills, and there the supersymmetry actually is real in a, in a, in a way, but uh, we still haven't uh, finished analyzing that. It is much more complicated. So uh, we were hoping, in fact, that's that's the sort of the second part of this project is to try to understand the pluricomplex structure from the real point of view by supersymmetry. But then that requires uh, slightly more complicated. Uh, so I cannot give you an answer yet, but I hope to at some point uh, be able to answer that question. Is there a superspace and supergravity approach to this problem where you, where you get this extra term from some limit? It's possible, I don't know. I mean, in fact, so I started thinking about this problem a long, long time ago, and I had forgotten about it. Um, and in, 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 in a, I think about the year 2000, Matthias Blau wrote down, okay, I, I was, let me, let me backtrack. So I was raised uh, with the idea that if you wanted supersymmetry, rigid supersymmetry on, on curved manifolds, you, in some sense, couldn't do it. You had to, or you had to consider supergravity. When, if you want supersymmetry on curved manifolds, you would have to, to consider supergravity. So it was rather surprising in 2000 when Matthias Blau wrote down some um, rigid supersymmetric actions whose spinners were not, of course, parallel spinners, but, but rather killing spinners. And I remember when I saw this paper, and we were in conversations at that time on a, on a number of topics, and I did mention that these theories could be, in fact, used to understand hyperbolic monopole <laughs> space. And then I forgot about this until uh, last year. And uh, I, it, so, so I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, to me, somehow I prefer working with rigid supersymmetric theories than with supergravity and then taking a limit if I can avoid it. Yes, Martin. Like, I mean, of course, ADS. Yeah, yeah okay, not gauge super. No, what? Like a rigid ADS theories were known 
very long time ago, right? It was first constructed by Zumino. OK, so that was me being ignorant. But it was well known that you had killing spinners in, in ADS. And these were gauge theories in ADS? Um, well, he, he just he did actually a nonlinear realization. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it is certainly very well known, ancient knowledge, that uh, there were killing spinners on ADS. Yeah, sure. But I didn't know that there were gauge theories on ADS, rigid supersymmetric gauge theories on ADS. Well, well then it follows. I mean, it follows deductively. If you okay. It was the work of Sen on, on circuits, right? On, 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 on S4 and products of, on, products of S1 and S3, etc. Not Ashok Sen, another Sen. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, but so, so when was that? So it, that was, uh, so that's, that's always talked about by, by Cyber, right? I think that's, that was in the, maybe in the, uh, the 80s, early 80s. Or something. Really? Okay. And that was just brute force. So that was just, uh, you know, using the other method and trying to write down the edge. But so, I mean, if, so perhaps other cases can be studied in this way, starting from super gravity. And yeah, that, that's certainly the case. I mean, there's many theories that now we know how to get rigid supersymmetry by starting with supergravity and, fi and freezing some of the degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, but, that, I'm saying but I'm saying this one in particular. This one. Yeah, I don't know. But um, in particular, I mean, it's actually, you don't really need supergravity because with one understanding the structure of supergravity, we know that if you're looking at conformally flat theories, uh, you can basically replace the biomultiple. Uh, you set the biomultiple to zero and you have just a conformal compensating multiple. So it is in, intrinsically a rigid theory. That should be possible to do all this in. In fact, the superconformal theory in four dimensions mm -hmm. impose the E1 invariance just the way you found in the right. paper. And you simply get the, the three-dimensional supersymmetric theory. Yeah, that should work. I have a stupid question. If um, what happens, is there an obvious reason why you can't do this? If, if we don't impose that it's uh, U1 invariant, but U1 invariant up the gauge transformation, or did you get something interesting, or is it can you reduce it to the Or it is already up to this. Yeah, I think so. It has to be. It's only defined up. So it's yeah. not really U1 invariant. It's only it's one way in the physical sense. In the physical sense, yeah. Okay. So that is the definition. Other questions? Oh, thank you very much.